Hey guys, it's Bella. Welcome back to my channel. Welcome back to another Mystery Monday. I hope you guys all had the best weekend. If you're new here on Mondays, we talk about true crime cases here on this channel. So if that's something you're interested in, come join us. Please make sure to subscribe. Today's case is definitely one of the most bizarre cases I've ever done. I won't spoil anything for you, but it basically involves a man's body being found under a toilet, like in the sewage tank underneath a toilet. Um, so yeah. Very weird. There's a lot of theories about this one, so I'm really excited to have a chat with you guys in the comments about this one because I wanna know your thoughts. Uh, <laughs> because I think you'll have some very interesting things to say about this case, so let's get into it. This case takes place in 1989 in a small Japanese village called Miyakoji. It's located in what is now known as the Tamura district of Fukushima. On the 28th of February, it was, you know, getting to the end of winter, but it was still super cold and there was a thick layer of snow that was blanketing the whole village. And a 23 year old woman who I'm gonna keep nameless, but I will refer to her as the teacher in this video. So that morning she heads to the local elementary school, which is where she worked. It was just a regular day for her. You know, she had just gotten back from a long weekend away where she was visiting relatives. By 5 p.m. she finished work and she headed to the female dormitories on the school grounds, which is where she lived. She lived in a single dormitory, which had like a little squat toilet room sort of attached to it. When she gets back to her dorm, she goes to use the toilet and this is when things get really weird. So before she uses the toilet, she kind of looks down into the bowl and she sees something that, you know, you don't really expect to see in a toilet. She sees a man's black leather shoe. Obviously her initial thought process is just confusion. She thinks maybe someone's playing a prank on her or maybe somebody had tried to break into her house or something like that. So she decides to go out and investigate. Her toilet was a squat toilet. So the bowl was set into the ground and then a small U-shaped pipe connected the bowl directly to a sewage tank, which is emptied from the outside. So she went outside to the sewage tank and she noticed that the covering of the tank was open and she looked inside and what she saw inside the tank made her let out this scream that had other teachers, other people on the grounds, on the dormitories come running to her. And her scream was totally justified because she saw a man's legs in this sewage tank. So there was a whole man in the sewage tank of her toilet. Her fellow teachers and the principal of the school came to check out what was going on. And when they looked inside and kind of inspected what was going on with this man inside, it was clear that this guy was no longer alive. One of her colleagues calls the police. The police come out and they confirm what everyone kind of already assumed that this person in the sewage tank was dead. They began efforts to try and remove the corpse, but they couldn't get him out because the outer pipe of the sewage tank was only 36 centimeters wide. So when they tried to pull him out, they just could not fit him through that pipe. According to Japan's Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry in 2004, the average shoulder width for men in Japan aged between 25 and 29 is 40.4 centimeters. So even if this man had a below average shoulder width, it would have been quite a feat for him to have squeezed into the pipe. And the pipe that connected the sewer tank from the inside, like from the squat toilet bowl was only 20 centimeters wide. So there was no way he could have gotten into that tank from the inside. And while it may have been difficult to get in from the outside, it was obviously possible because, you know, he was in there. But there were a lot of questions as to how he got in there because if authorities couldn't even pull his body out, then how did he do it? Like, how did he squeeze in there? Did he contort his body? Was he maybe shoved in there by another person? Unfortunately, the police were quite rough with his body when they were trying to get it out because, you know, they were just the local police. This was a small village. And so they were totally out of their depth to say the least. And they also figured like, if he got in there, we can pull him out. So they were really giving it a red hot shot and they just couldn't do it. So in that process, some of the evidence may have been damaged. But like I said, they were just the local police of this little village. And so they were totally out of their depth. They ended up calling for reinforcements from the nearby Harumachi police station. And with these reinforcements, three firefighters were sent who had to use an excavator and a crane to pull the pipe out of the ground and then cut it open in order to get this man's corpse out of the pipe. 
When they managed to get him out, they found this man inside the pipe in a fetal position. He was bare chested, like no clothes on the upper half of his body. And he had a neatly folded coat pressed against his chest and he was wearing no shoes. There was one shoe found in the tank with him, but it was in front of his whole body. So like in front of his head, which is why that's what the teacher saw when she looked into the squat bowl. The tank was so small that there's no way he could have taken his shoes or his coat off while he was in the tank. So he obviously took them off before he went in, which is also confusing because, I mean, maybe he took the coat off before going in because he couldn't fit in and squeeze his body in there with the coat on, but why would he bring the coat in with him? Why wouldn't he leave it outside so it doesn't get covered in feces? It was just a whole weird situation. Like everything about this situation was super strange. He was also facing the toilet's inner opening, like facing the part where you would sit on the bowl and do your business. And the inside of the tank was too narrow to turn around. So it's almost certain he went into the tank head first. When they pulled him out of the pipe, he was obviously covered in feces. So authorities had to thoroughly clean him twice and they said it smelled horrific, which worst day of work ever. Imagine showing up to work and they're like, oh, we've found some dude in a toilet pipe and he's covered in shit and you've got to clean him off. Sorry about it. I would just quit. I would say I'm not doing that. I'm quitting. <laughs> I couldn't. And even worse, while they were cleaning him, obviously this is a small village, not a lot happens. So word spread pretty quickly about the whole situation and a bunch of just local people from the village came to watch the authorities, you know, excavate this man, get him out of the pipe, clean all the poo off him. And there was quite a crowd too, because you know, it was big news in this small village. And once they finished cleaning this man off, this crowd of locals who was watching all of this happen, a bunch of them immediately recognized the guy as 26 year old Nayuki Kano. He was a pretty prominent member of the community and he was well known and well liked by pretty much everyone. He was an active helper at the Villagers Youth Club where he would provide assistance to villagers in need. Everyone in the community loved his cheerful personality, the fact that he was always willing to lend a helping hand. And they liked him so much that he was often called upon to give public speeches and even officiate people's weddings. In high school, he played guitar for a band and he had a passion for writing songs and he was just a really popular, well-liked guy. He worked as a sales director for a nuclear power maintenance company because that industry was like really booming in Japan at the time. By the time Nayuki's body was found in the sewage tank, he had been missing for four days. So he was last seen on the 24th of February when he left the house that he shared with his parents. He told his dad before he left, I'm going out drinking with some co-workers. I'm probably going to be a while. And then he didn't return home that night, which wasn't really of concern to his parents because he was a young guy. He would often go out drinking with his friends and co-workers, wouldn't come home for the night. But they did grow concerned after a few days when he still hadn't come home, they still hadn't heard from him. And so after three days, they contacted the police, reported him missing and search efforts began. His car was found in a farmhouse parking lot, which was located near the elementary school that obviously his body would be found at the next day. The keys were found still in the car, which indicated that he was planning on returning to the car very quickly. He wasn't gonna be long doing whatever it was that he was doing. But police had no indications as to why he would even be near the school, what he was doing there. They had just a lot of questions and very few answers. And then of course, the next day, his body was found. Like I said, only one of his shoes was found in the tank with him. And shortly after the discovery of his body, his other shoe was also found a few hundred meters away from his car on a riverbank. So anyway, after his body was extracted and cleaned, they took it to the local fire station where a medical examiner performed an autopsy. During this autopsy, due to the state of rigor mortis on the body, it was determined that he had actually died two days earlier on the 26th of February. So two whole days after he was last seen by his parents leaving the house. They found no signs of foul play. They found no signs of a struggle. So his death was ruled an accident due to hypothermia and thoracic circulation disorder, which basically means that he froze and was squished to death. They did find some cuts on his elbows and his knees, which indicated that he had gone into the pipe willingly because he would have sustained these scratches as he was like trying to crawl into the pipe. And then once he was in the pipe and was trying to get out, you know, he would have been using his elbows and his knees and 
kind of scratching them up in the process, which is insane that he managed to crawl into that pipe and nobody knows how he did it, but somehow he did. Despite the smell, despite how disgusting that pipe would have been, he did. God knows why. I mean, we're gonna get into theories in just a second about why, but good Lord, just when you think you've heard it all. You have also heard pretty much all of this case. So we're gonna get into theories now because honestly, there's not a lot of information. So that means there is a lot of speculation. The first theory is the Peeping Tom theory. And this theory was suggested by authorities due to the findings of their investigation. Basically, like I said, there were no signs of foul play. There were scratches on his elbows and his knees, which suggested that he had tried to crawl in there himself and also had tried to get out himself, but he couldn't do it, which suggested that he had gone in there trying to peep on the teacher when she, you know, took a squat trying to use the toilet. And then he just got stuck down there. The orientation of his body also fits with this theory. The fact that his head was toward the squatting bowl, his legs were folded to fit the space. It just seemed to indicate that he purposely entered the tank to try and peep. But it seems maybe he didn't put enough thought into how he would get out because he couldn't uncross his arms from his chest. And with his arms in that position, he couldn't contort himself again to get out. It was just, he was too wide to push himself back out. So he got stuck, which explains the scratches on his knees and his elbows even more because he would have been, once he realized he was stuck and didn't know how to get out, he would have been violently, you know, kind of scratching and wiggling to try and get out of there, causing all of these scratches, but he just, he couldn't. The position he got into the toilet in made it impossible for him to get back out. Also, if he was forced into such a narrow pipe, there would be a lot more injury on his body than what the autopsy found. Because if someone is trying to stuff a dead body into a small little pipe, they're not going to be gentle. You know, they're going to shove him in there and push him in there. There's going to be bruising. There's going to be crushing. And also, why would an attacker take the time to neatly fold his coat and then put it on his body and then put it in there with him. If they were gonna put the coat in there, they would just shove the coat in with him. They're not gonna take the time to fold it neatly or do any of that. I also can't think of why else a person would get into a sewage pipe like that. It's so disgusting. There really isn't another explanation other than to peep. And ultimately this is what the police concluded. Now Yuku's parents, however, totally refute these claims. They could not imagine their son doing something like this, which I'm sure no parent can imagine that their son is such a perv that he squeezes himself into a sewage tank to watch people take dumps. Nayuki's father actually went as far as to use the cut out sewage pipe to reenact the situation and came to his own conclusion that there was no way that his son could have contorted his body to get into those pipes. He basically said there's no way Nayuki got in there himself. But of course there is a lot of debate about this. He was also a really well-liked guy, good reputation in the village. So a lot of locals didn't believe that he would do something like this and would, you know, perv on unsuspecting women in the village. Over 4,000 people actually signed a petition to have the police re-examine the case because they just thought there was no way. And a lot of the people who signed this petition were locals. They believed that foul play must have been involved because there was no way that he would climb in there himself. All I know, if there's one thing I've learned from doing these cases is that people can hide a lot of themselves from the people around them. Like people really are not gonna go around advertising the darkest parts of themselves. It's not like he's going around town advertising that he's a creep. Personally, I believe this theory because of the evidence, because of the fact that there's no bruising on his body. There's no evidence to suggest that somebody had, you know, forcefully put his body in there. And the scratch marks on his arms and knees suggest that he was crawling in there and trying to crawl out of there himself. And what other reason is there to climb into a sewage tank, you know? Like, I just think that this is the most likely theory. Now, another theory is that Nayuki and the teacher were potentially romantically involved. Unfortunately, it's hard to know the full extent of their relationship because there are a lot of differing reports, a lot of reports saying they knew each other really well, a lot of reports saying that they were just acquaintances. Whatever the case is, what we do know is that they did at least know each other. So they were at least acquaintances, but it's not 
clear or not confirmed if they were anything beyond this so this theory is really just speculation and I mean pretty much all of the theories are really just speculation because the case isn't solved and that's what a theory is it's just people speculating about what could have happened but basically some sources indicated that there may have been a love triangle between Nayuki the teacher and her boyfriend or that the teacher may have been cheating on her boyfriend with Nayuki. Other sources reported that Nayuki was actually a good friend of the teacher's boyfriend and that together they actually managed to track down this guy who had been calling the teacher a bunch and like harassing her. Whatever their connection was, at the very least, we know that they knew each other, which means that it's possible that he knew she was going to be away from the 24th to the 28th. But assuming Nayuki knew this information and assuming he crawled into the tank on the day that he disappeared on the 24th of February, why would he crawl in there knowing that she was going to be away for the next four days. No food, no water, it's freezing out and he had to take his coat off to get in there. There's tons of snow, like it just doesn't make any sense. I mean maybe he was practicing, maybe he knew she was going to be away for four days so he decided to practice getting into the sewage tank so he could watch her and then practice getting out so that he could get out without her detecting that he was even in there, you know what I mean? Maybe he knew that she was going away on the 24th, but he didn't know how long she was gonna be away for, or maybe he didn't know that she was gonna be away at all. Maybe he was stalking her, saw her leave, and was like, okay, now's my opportunity. I'm gonna go get in the sewage tank and wait for her to get back. He might have thought that she was just popping out for a quick second to go get some groceries or go and see a friend, talk to a friend, talk to somebody in the dormitories. Because remember, he left his keys in his car, which indicated that he thought he was gonna be returning to that car pretty quickly. He's also a pretty smart dude, and none of this seems very smart. Squeezing into a small place with no way out and to perv on somebody who's not even gonna be there, like it's just super odd. I don't know as well, you know, there's a lot of aspects to this, or a lot of ways this theory could go. For example, maybe he was spying on the teacher and her boyfriend noticed and then kind of killed him and decided to stuff him in the sewage tank. Or maybe he just found out that they were having an affair and so again, he killed him and stuffed him in the sewage tank. Now the next theory actually implicates the teacher in Naiki's death. Firstly, you know, when she discovered the body and saw that shoe for the first time, it was dark. The pit in the toilet is quite deep. So some people say, how could she have seen the shoe in those conditions? You know, it's dark, the shoe is black, it's so far down. How could she look in there and even have noticed it in the first place? As I mentioned, she had also gone away for four days from the 24th to the 28th of February, which coincides with how long Naiki was missing for. And you know, the day that she left is the day that he disappeared. Now this theory, kind of goes hand in hand with the love triangle theory but it extends on it a bit to say that maybe they had actually gone on holiday together for these four days and then either the teacher's boyfriend found out and then an altercation broke out between him and Nayuki or that Nayuki wanted to kind of cement their relationship and make it public and an altercation broke out because the teacher didn't want that to happen. The fact that you know he was barefoot as well and was found with just one shoe in the tank raised a lot of questions because why would he take his shoes off especially considering the other shoe was found like a few hundred meters away why would he take his shoes off it's freezing it's snowy it's not the kind of terrain you want to be barefoot in maybe this did indicate some sort of foul play maybe there was some sort of struggle and that resulted in his shoes coming off like for example the struggle could have happened back where his other shoe was found a few hundred meters away from his car and then he was taken to and stuffed in that septic tank with his other shoe and his coat so that it was all in the tank kind of the evidence was disposed with him or maybe the struggle happened near the septic tank, they shoved everything in, but then they decided to take one shoe away to make it a bit more confusing for everybody and make it look like an accident. I mean, I can't imagine why he would take one shoe off so far away and then trek to the septic tank with just one shoe on. I, maybe he was trying to cover his tracks, trying not to leave these two shoe prints, but th that doesn't make any sense because then why did he have one shoe with him and one shoe not with him. Or maybe he was gonna use the whole thing as a cover story. Maybe he took the shoes off where the other shoe was found near the riverbank and he walked over to the septic tank barefoot, brought one of the shoes with him. He wasn't wearing them though because he wanted to cover his tracks. Didn't wanna leave shoe prints that could be tied to him. And then he had the one shoe to kind of 
use it as a cover story. Like, oh, I dropped my shoe in there. So I had to go in and get it. I promise I wasn't being a perv. Pretty shit cover story to climb into a toilet because <laughs> I would just part with the shoe. But you know, people's brains work in different mysterious ways. Obviously these theories are mostly fueled by rumors and because when things can't be explained, people try to make sense of them in any way that they can. And it didn't make sense that he was found in the teacher's septic tank while she was away. Also the fact that she found his body really fueled these rumors. Honestly, I don't really believe this theory because First of all, again, it all comes down to that evidence. There was no evidence of a struggle. There would have been a lot more bruising and crushing of his body if someone really had just stuffed his body through that pipe. And also if the teacher and her boyfriend were responsible, surely they would have done a better job of disposing of the body. They wouldn't implicate themselves by putting it in the teacher's sewage tank. They would have taken the body away from themselves and removed themselves from the situation. So that brings us to the last, the fourth and final theory, which is that this was related to Nayuki's work. As I mentioned earlier, he was a sales director for a nuclear power maintenance company. And at the time of his death, there was actually a local election coming out for the village chief. And there was a lot of debate about the potential expansion of the Fukushima nuclear power plant coming into the village. Whilst it would have benefited the village economically, there were some serious health concerns for the people who lived in the village if this expansion were to happen. Nayuki had actually once investigated the Fukushima power plant with the help of another colleague. And just one month before Nayuki's death, this colleague actually tragically ended his own life. So the theory goes that when they were doing this investigation, they may have found out something that somebody wanted hidden, or they may have angered somebody from the Fukushima power plant or someone involved in the election. And this person or this group of people they angered may be responsible for both of their deaths. Further to this theory, Naoki had actually been a vocal supporter of the current mayor in the lead up to the election. And then he just abruptly stopped supporting this person. So rumors were that he found out about some shady dealings going on with the local government and he wanted no part in it. And if he did uncover something, it must have been pretty bad for him to just abruptly cut ties and, you know, stop voicing support of this person considering he had been such a vocal supporter. But yeah, that's everything. That's all the theories. That's all the information for this case. I know it's not a big one. There's not a lot of information, but it's definitely a weird one. And I would love to hear what you guys think. I know you're going to have some opinions on this one for sure. Personally, I do just think, I believe the peeping Tom theory. I think that's the most logical explanation based on the evidence that we have, based on the fact that there's not really any bruising or crushing or really any evidence to suggest any foul play, any signs of a struggle, any signs that he had been physically forced into that pipe. I mean, I don't want to believe it's true because I don't want to believe there is some little perv who is willing to climb through a feces covered sewage tank in order to watch unsuspecting women poop. But we know there are people out there like that, unfortunately. There are some sick freaks in our world. And it just makes the most sense with the evidence that we have. But yeah, I'm really looking forward to hearing what you guys think about this one because <laughs> I don't even know. This, it was just such a weird case. I just really want to have a chat to you guys about it. So let me know what you think. But that's everything from me today, guys. So I hope you have a great rest of your day. And hopefully I will see you in my next video. Bye, guys.